So, welcome to today's uh, presentation about uh, OpenSUSE and Agama. It's basically a follow-up of uh, yesterday's presentation when uh, where Anchor present Agama, the live demo. And uh, yeah, this is this is planned to be more interactive. So, if you have any question any time during presentation, feel free to indicate it to Anchor, who's sitting here with microphone. We'll bring you the microphone, and yeah, you can provide feedback, ask questions, whatever you want. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, some notes. Uh, Agama is still under development, so now it's great time to affect what it will can do and how it behave. So, uh, and it also works the other way. That uh, something that currently Agama can do is maybe it won't do in the final version. So it's up to you to affect how it will look like. So what's the plan for this presentation is basically giving a quick overview. Uh, if you want to see it in action or want to see something behind, there is uh, Angus presentation from uh, yesterday about the demo and uh, from one year ago on OpenSUSE conference, there's more about reasoning behind it and some decisions, some architecture and stuff like this. So, about the overview, uh, just it's intended for SLE 16, so it's next our next installer. Uh, the main goal is do only the mandatory stuff or the stuff that's really hard to do after after the initial boot. Uh, basically, what's easier to be done on the system should be done on the system instead of installer. There's many reasons of it. Yeah, probably the main one is uh, that you, you have your target system when you are familiar with it. Instar is just one of possible systems and uh, you prefer to do it in your favorite environment. Yeah, it's web-based. I will uh, mention uh, it also further, some advantages that it has. And yeah, goal is also to be flexible enough to uh, to basically take all the possible features we get in past and try to incorporate it in new installer that it can it will be prepared for it from the beginning and not doing it by some workarounds uh, it has multiple interfaces probably the the most visible one will be the web interface but it has also the command line uh, and it it, uh, it has http service uh, basically, those command line and web uses this HTTP service, so it's uh, fully uh, controlled remotely by HTTP service. And yeah, the, it has some advantages, like you can uh, program it or uh, you can connect it to some other applications like SUSE Manager. So this is how it looks like. If you want to see more, I suggest Anchor's presentation. And just a reminder, this is how looks the, the Qt interface in current uh, Tumbleweed installer. That's uh, from Yast. You can say that, yeah, this, this, this Qt doesn't look so bad. Uh, and it's true, it looks quite, quite good on, on desktops. But main difference why the web-based is better is that uh, if you have any display device, then basically for Qt, it means if someone in Qt start uh, to porting Qt to that device. But with web-based technology, it's like any display device, if it cannot display web page, it's like that device. Yeah, so basically hardware vendors early tries to have a browser there that can display web pages. So it's no longer our jobs or Qt maintainers' jobs to try to port it, and instead, it's yeah, we basically get it for free. And it's not just about browsers; it's all also about all infrastructure around, like accessibility devices and uh, various stuff. Yeah, basically, everything now lives in on the web, so yeah, everything is adapted to work with web interface. Yeah, and of course, we have the old anchors. Yeah, it's up to you how you like it, uh, how do you see it. I will also mention it in one of the future slides because, yeah, it's, it looks like nice retro, but yeah, it can scare some 
users if they see it as the first time when they boot uh, the medium. Yeah, and of course, today is the official release of Agama 9. Our blog post is published. So what you see on that screenshot is currently living in Agama 9. So feel free to download it. We have some announcement on our blog. So give it a try yourself and you will see. Yeah, and of course, on barbecue, you can yeah, take one beer for Agama. <laughs> so uh, now I will slightly talk about OpenSUSE and in installer in general. Why OpenSUSE needs or should have installer, because of course there's, there are distributions that don't have installer at all, and it still lives, and yeah, you can use it. So, uh, first reason is some kind of public relationships. If a uh, new release happens, like for new Leap, for new Ubuntu, for whatever, in technical articles, what you see in screenshots is basically, usually it's three times installer and once the desktop with new background. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah. Of course, if you look at it from the other side, what, what others should the journalists show? Everyone has Firefox, everyone has uh, Steam running, everyone has LibreOffice, so it's the same for each distro. But what's, what's unique on that new release is usually some theming, so that background, uh, yeah, and installer, because currently each distribution has its own installer. So it's, uh, the installer is good for, for that uh, public releases. Of course, it's also good when you promote uh, the, the open source to others. If there is some uh, good installer that can help them to, to install it, uh, giving a good first impression, that uh, yeah, you, you send them, hey, try, try OpenSUSE, and if they see yeah, some nice UI that, uh, like, yeah, yeah, it's cool, because previously they maybe tried to install Windows or macOS, and yeah, it also looks, looks good. If, if you promote OpenSUSE, and they, then they uh, for example, it's case for VSL. Like, uh, you are a Windows user, yeah, just give it a try in OpenSUSE. Now OpenSUSE has VSL images, it's good. So they uh, give it a try, and in VSL, uh, yeah, due to technical reasons, we have uh, the anchors' this first boot. Yeah, and they, then the key, it, it quite scares them. Even if you check it in OpenQA, we have, yeah, that Windows. 12 that looks yeah yeah quite good and then you have that anchors this window that yeah looks really retro but I worry that it can scare some people. Yeah, another reason for installer is uh, uh, it can help users because for me Linux is always about uh, choices. Yeah, with macOS or with yeah, with macOS basically you have golden cage where yeah you you. You have everything set in stone, everything works together, but you don't have much choices. And for Windows, it's yeah, also quite similar. There, there, are, there are more choices, but sometimes it's not so easy to do to the change because yeah, it's intended to do one way, and other ways is is more tricky. So uh, installer in this in this way, basically, is guide to help help to show those choices to, to make some reasonable defaults, but allows user easily to change these defaults to something that fits their needs. Yeah, and uh, installer also uh, should help with uh, respecting uh, differences of, of users. Some users have fast internet, some have small internet, uh, slow, uh, uh, small bandwidth, so, so they don't need uh, uh, to install big big stuff like they, they can at work download the whole big ISO and just install it at home when uh, they have issue with uh, amount of data. Also about accessibility, yeah. If, if you have good installer, it can help people that that for example have problems with colors, with uh, eyes and other stuff. And uh, of course with different hardware, installer can. Help you, yeah. For example, Tumbleweed still still doing 32-bit uh, x86, so it helps with people that have old hardware and just wants to have something running on it. That's yeah, something that you cannot really do with with, for example, Windows. 
they, they basically just cut it off and you need to throw away old hardware. And yeah, yeah for Windows, old hardware is quite new. I, I, I would say that, yeah, we support much more old hardware, so it's also a bit eco-friendly to, to allow users to, to use their old hardware. Yeah, for, for, uh, for newcomers, uh, installer is important because installer should have minimal mandatory choices because each choice, when, when you are new to something and don't know much about it, then every choice uh, creates a bit of stress because you don't know what to select. And uh, of course, what helps is also smart proposals. So even if you select only do really minimal choices, the rest should just work. Whatever hardware you have, whatever you use, it, smart proposal should help you to, to have it from the start. And of course, newcomers don't like some surprises, like uh, if they try OpenSUSE and they have Windows uh, pre-installed on machine and wants to use it, they don't want uh, to install, to install it, just silently kill their Windows. That's, yeah, that's uh, not so nice. So, Currently, we, uh, the installer supports the resizing of Windows and allows you to have multi-boot and, and stuff like this. So for newcomers, uh, installer is quite helpful. And yeah, here is probably my, my, my first uh, note about current installer. It's a decision that's made that for desktop environment, we don't have default. So user need to select, but uh, uh, try to uh, be something that comes to from, from Windows when there is no desktop environment. And now you give a try OpenSUSE, and now you need to select if you want KDE, GNOME, uh, I think LXDE, the XFC4, and you don't know what to select. So, so this is already in current installer, the, the, the choice that uh, confuse some customers. So maybe it will be helpful to again introduce the default for desktop environment. I don't want to even say any word about what it should be. That, yeah, I don't want to start a flame, but yeah, I think it would be helpful to have yeah, just some default for, for the newcomers uh, when they don't know what they, what they want, just give them some reasonable default for a desktop environment. So, let's start a flame. <laughs> Who think that KDE should be the default desktop environment? Just three, four, five, six, seven, seven, eight, eight. Okay. So who thinks that GNOME should be the default for the for the tumbleweed? Yeah, three, four, yeah, eight, nine. Yeah, it's it's very close. And uh, XFC four. Yeah, yeah, it's it's four. So, yeah, it looks like it, if it wants to have default, it will be a big battle bit, between KDE and GNOME. But yeah, I think it can help cause, uh, the, the newcomers to basically have some good DE. I think both of them are good DE. But yeah, yeah, it's for them hard to decide, especially if you Google what's better. Then yeah, you get long mailing thread or a long discussion if KDE or GNOME, and that newcomers don't know what to select. Yeah, and then there is experienced users and uh, why they want installer. Yeah, basically they, they know already what they want. And uh, so, so they want to do some changes that fits their needs. They want to do it in an efficient way. Uh, but also they are quite focused. They are focused on some parts. They are experienced in some parts. But for other parts, they also expect some reasonable, pro uh, reasonable proposals that they don't need to care about. They, for example, want to play a bit with partitioning, they want some RAID, some LVMs, but uh, they don't care what uh, encryption is used for root password. Basically, they, they trust the V, uh, or installer selects the resemble one. So that's uh, yeah. why I think that uh, open source and an installer still makes sense to have something to show for users. Yeah, and now let's uh, yeah, start with a bit more questions because now it's about specifically Agama. What Agama do is, uh, can do is install multiple distributions. I've, you already see it in Ankara's presentation or even in Lubosch talk about Leap16 where, where he created the Agama ISO that can install Leap16 together with Tumbleweed. 
w uh, with uh, micro OS. So for same code, this is quite easy. But for di different code stream, it starts to be harder because uh, software stack. Basically, just imagine now that uh, if we want now have one ISO that can install everything we currently provide, so it means Tumbleweed and Leap 15.6, if it's possible. Currently, what, what happens is that uh, on installer medium, you have some RPM and it do installation into root. And uh, of course, that RPM versions between Tumbleweed and Leap very differs. Yeah, and I think it differs in a way that if you use um, RPM from Tumbleweed, the, then after reboot, the RPM on, on Leap probably won't work due to differences in RPM database and stuff like this. And maybe even some, some other, other parts won't work. So uh, we think a bit about how to solve it, and if you really want different code streams uh, installable from one uh, installer, then possible option would be to have uh, that software stack in container. So basically, if you select Tumbleweed for installation, it will load container built on top of Tumbleweed that contains uh, RPM, libzip, and yeah, some, some small debug service that, that will be provided to system service, uh, to system uh, bus. And same for Leap. For Leap, it will use the RPM from Leap and also libzip from Leap and yeah, just provide that provided to, to the bus. So my question is uh, if, if you think it's uh, yeah, reasonable to have multiple streams from one ISO, if you see some usage, like, uh, yeah, may, maybe it can be like something like prom promote ISO that, uh, yeah, on open source conference or on uh, con open source booths, we can uh, give people the USB and that USB can contain an in installer that include all of those, yeah, like Tumbleweed Leap, and then it's up to user what, what they want to install, but if, if the effort makes sense. So my question is, who will use such, uh, such ISO that can install Tumbleweed Leap and Micro? Yeah, so eight people, and yeah, yeah. so similar to GNOME, so just <laughs> smaller half. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> other question is, when we solve that software stack, then uh, when you think about differences between other distributions like yeah, Fedora, Ubuntu, and others, then also the main difference is uh, their software stack. Yeah, Ubuntu uses Debian uh, for, Red Hat, for Fedora or Red Hat distributions in general. They don't use patterns like we use it, but they use groups for Anaconda. So uh, if we can have that container, then yeah, I think it will be possible to install for Agama for, or uh, other distributions. So question is if yeah, we should somehow work on it and kind of promote it. Like, yeah, if you want to create your new distribution that's based on whatever you want, if you want installer, you can use Agama. So that's questionable. If we want to uh, still have our SUSE or OpenSUSE installer having just SUSE OpenSUSE specific or try to provide it also to wider audience and other distributions. So my question is who would like to install other distribution that's not from SUSE, from Agama. Yeah, I see Neil. Yeah, yeah, more. Four, four people. Five. Yeah, it can be, for example, helpful also for uh, SUSE manager and uh, Yomi in U Uni. Yeah, yeah, I, my pronunciation is bad. Uh, uh, it can be helpful also for them because they allow to manage the other distributions and if they have one unified installer that can install any distribution they support, it will be much easier to, to, to really allow easy deployment of new machines with whatever distribution than they want. Good, so there's more than zero positive votes on it. Yeah, uh, another topic to discuss is probably what to install. Currently, Agama using uh, the common stack from Yast, which means installing RPMs. Uh, it's, I would say, well working, because yeah, it's working for, for years, it has many features. But uh, new 
basic new ways how to install or even new uh, software stacks, yeah, like uh, flat packs or container arise. So question is if Agama should start doing it. Uh, at first, I will uh, stop for that uh, images because that's, uh, I would say, how Micro 6 is the main, main deployment way is installing images. In general, it should not be hard to adapt Adama, uh, Agama to install images, but uh, the, the tricky part is not deployment of image, but basically the limitation of users. Because if there is image, that image contai, contain file system. And yeah, feel free to correct me if there is people that knows more about images than me, that uh, image contain file system. So if user decide in partition that they want a separate partition for something that already contain data in image, then uh, it will be overwritten by, by that separate partition because you, you deploy image to partition. So we are, uh, if, if we start doing it, we probably need to yeah, like mount image and then start, start copying content, not just deploying quickly image, if uh, uh, exactly for the reason of separate, party, uh, separate partitions. And yeah, other problems is that image basically needs to be prepared for everything. It's like even current uh, Agama, that ISO is kind of image. It's image that can boot, that we kind of fine-tune it, like we remove our audio cards. But on target system, you probably don't need all, film, all, all firmware that uh, yeah, takes space. So with RPMs, we have our RPM provides, and basically that RPM provides ensure that uh, your hardware get uh, the firmware that can run it, or kernel modules that, that can run it. And target system contain only what, what's needed. But uh, if you deploy image, you, you don't have this optimization. You basically need to deploy all possible, possible stuff to be able to boot. And another uh, yeah, issue we have with images is uh, additional software. Because uh, depending what you select in installer, it can install some additional software, like if you select separate XFCE uh, XFS uh, partition, then uh, it's nice that uh, installer automatically installs all that XFC, XFS utils. And it also works for other parts. If you, if you want uh, TPM2, then yeah, it installs software for TPM2. But if you don't use it, the software is not there. So basically, it's like, it's like if you prepare the image for target system, then installer tries to do it the same with, uh, by themselves, by depending on your choice, to create the, the minimal system that works for you, but uh, contain everything you can find useful. And that's something we don't have for images. Uh, for images, uh, what to do uh, currently the Fedora, with Fedora Workstation, is that, that Anaconda, uh, they have live, live image. They have some uh, overlay, I think overlay FS, basically overlay it file system. And the first layer is a uh, read-only system of the live, live uh, medium. And when they do installation, they don't allow any software changes, and they just take the, the, the uh, first layer and copy it to target system. And what uh, Anaconda cannot, uh, currently cannot do is uh, more adaptation. Basically, they can deploy image, or they can uh, install RPMs, or do some other things, but just one of it. So our idea is that for images, we can do that we can install image and install additional software by R R RPMs on top of it. But question is if, if it will be needed. Yeah? Ne Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, Ankur will come. There have been people interested in OpenSUSE for a while to be able to build installable live environments, which Yast used to support 10 years ago and dropped it, and it would be nice to have that ability again with, a, with the Agama stack. And also that makes it easier to use with non-SUSE distributions because the, the scope of things you actually have to manipulate to install becomes much smaller.
Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's true. That's also why I mentioned that currently our install is basically a specific image that's tuned to, to be able to, uh, to run installer, but uh, doesn't contain other stuff. Like, yeah, f that Federal Life image contains much more, like try your system and then install it. But it needs to contain everything that should be on target system. So our, our image is smaller. Currently, Agama, that doesn't contain repositories, is like 660 megabytes of ISO. And yeah, I will talk about it later, because yeah, that's something that can be also maybe improved. So just another suggestion here. Um, here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what I like to do is actually creating my own images um, that are prepared for the target system, sometimes even with an application that starts right after installation. And um, that's something that I do within OBS, with uh, Kiwi, of course. And I wonder if something like that would also be possible. Just keep in mind, if you have something like an image that actually does nothing but prepare system automation stuff like salt or whatever you use, um, that's actually how far you have to go until you, you, you really continue with some, some different environment to prepare your actual system. So this is not so much about a desktop system, but about a server system, and sometimes even with just prepared hardware, like uh, you're in a virtualization system, or you're on mainframe, or whatever. So actually really prepared for the target system to a point that, well, you have to get that image on, on there, and that's your actual problem, and that's where you could step in here. Yeah, yeah, that's... That, uh, as I said, it, it's, uh, it's possible with image installation, but it also has some, some troubles, especially with the preparing system, partitioning. You need to be, yeah, ensure that, that it's there. Uh. Yeah, actually, that, that will be my question. So you mentioned that you want to build something, let's say, using Kiwi. Uh, so wouldn't the, the Kiwi self-installer, uh, an image generated with Kiwi that already has some kind of self-installer, which is basically DD, will be enough, and if not, what are you missing? Uh, uh, so what, which part of Agama would you like to use? Which features of Agama would you like to, to use for deployment, for deploying that, that particular image that you created that are, that are really not part of uh, the Kiwi self-installer, which is basically um, yeah, uh, a better DD, kind of? So the thing is that you have to get that Kiwi image somehow there. So you, you have to have a possibility, and maybe even one that's standardized, that actually gets you to the point that you are partitioned, that you have some specific whatever password setting or whatever you, you think you can think about, and then you just pull that image and, and copy it onto the block device. That's basically it. And then you might also want to have something like you have your system disk and your data disk, and therefore um, you actually don't really care if the system is overwritten completely. Yeah, yeah interesting use case. Yeah, so, yeah I, I think it should be doable. We, we just yeah, need to know about, about that, the requirement. Yeah, and uh, yeah, to yeah, as time flies, so let's step a, b a bit. Uh, actually, there is another question over there. Yeah, another person. Good. Yeah. Uh, I don't mind if we run out of time because people are asking questions. That was actually the goal anyway. So. I was more thinking loud when Anchor was demoing things yesterday. Maybe on the product page you can have a, for example, drop-down menu to add server or desktop, and that adds different pattern depending on which one you use. Uh, yeah, yeah, the server desktop, uh, we basically plan to have it in, uh, in more like in software selection screen, but yeah, yeah, it's kind of system role. We, we, we are, uh, our current approach is basically it's like server based. Like you select, you can select your desktop or you can select some, some basic server technologies in, in that uh, additional software selection. So it's currently there, but uh, yeah, having something like deploy this image and then do something else, or deploy on given partition, given image, it can be it can be interesting option. Yeah, but back and uh, slightly move forward. 
uh, about flat packs and containers, uh, we briefly discussed it, and yeah, I think the answer here is it's usually better to do it from target system, because uh, yeah, unless you have good use case for uh, needing flat pack or container right immediately after boot, then uh, there is no big need to to install it. Of course, if you start using something like boot C that can boot directly into container, it can be a slightly different topic, but in current state, I don't see much use of uh, additionally configuring flat packs and containers that you have from the start of an uh, installer uh, or after the first boot. Okay, so the next part is auto installation. It's maybe not so interesting for desktop users, but uh, for server part where you have multiple, multiple servers that you need to deploy, if it's, yeah, uniform enough, easy enough, probably image deployments when you have some fine-tuned image is, is good. But, uh, yeah, if you have various servers, then probably you need a bit of tweaking and having some, some kind of logic or using some proposals for the parts that's not uniform between servers. So what Agama provides is basically uh, partial auto support because, yeah, customers, and maybe not just customers, but uh, also open source users, if they use auto installation, they invest already uh, some effort, some money, some time to having their auto profile that just works. So we try to keep it as much as possible. So for the parts, that's already uh, configurable by Agama. We plan to support it uh, if the auto uh, profile conti contains those parts uh, supported in Agama. Of course, for the parts that's not part of it, uh, yeah, we, we probably cannot support it because we don't have ability to configure it. And now there is a question. Do you plan any kind of migration tool from the previous Autogast format to what now is in JSON? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what, what we do at the backend. We, uh, we basically have a Ruby tool that takes the Autogast profile, do some processing, and the output is JSON file that's uh, loaded into Agama. So that's exactly what we have. Currently, it's part of Agama. It's not uh, available separately. But yeah, if there's interest, uh, there's no big, uh, no big deal to, to do it. Of course, there is dependency on all the ask because it needs all, uh, all the ask processing to, to really sure that it's, it supports all the various schemas that Autoast have and uh, the various stuff. So, so to be sure that we, we process it correctly, we, we use the, the still the YAST code for, for processing that Autoast profiles. And when we get data, we, we translate it into JSON for Agama. So there is tool for it. Okay, the other part is uh, new stuff in Agama. It's basically JSON. You already see it in Anchor's presentation. It's the same JSON they, they use for editing configuration. Uh, that you can easily uh, obtain from the manual run. And yeah, that's, that's uh, I would say, also a common use case that if you have multiple servers, you want to try it on the first one manually, configure it as you want, if you are not sure what exactly you want to configure, and then take the JSON from it and yeah, just de uh, deploy, automatically deploy the, the other servers. And uh, other is JSONnet. It's basically DSL language for uh, uh, for JSON for producing JSON, and yeah, it quite surprised me. I, I would another question: Who knows uh, JSONnet here? Yeah, it's also quite quite small amount. It quite surprised me because yeah, JSON is quite uh, quite used in Kubernetes, so I kind of expect it's yeah cool new technology that everyone knows. But yeah, yeah, I get a similar feedback on uh, uh, two weeks ago on the conference, when uh, some people even think that, uh, when I show example, they think that's our own DSL language. So, uh, no, it's, it's not invented by us, it's really existing DSL for JSON. And uh, when it's useful, basically we inject their output from LSHV, so uh, hardware information. And for example, if you do that manual deployment of your first machine and do the st st static IP configuration, you assign the static IP. But for other servers, you don't want to use the same JSON, otherwise you end up with 200 servers with identical IP. And that's, yeah, 
that it doesn't work. So then you can use JSONnet, and for example, based on MAC address or whatever criteria you have, you can generate that static IP for uh, for a given installation. Sorry to interrupt, and one more note that, that just came to my mind, since you were talking about AutoJust compatibility and also about JSONnet, which is basically ha about having dynamic profiles that are adaptable to each machine. You may know that in AutoJust we also had mechanisms for that, like uh, rules and classes or uh, scripts. You could execute a script and modify the profile itself, and the, the profile was reloaded again. Um, we had uh, embedded Ruby, so you can have Ruby in, inside your AutoJust profile to do whatever. And I just wanted to mention that about that partial AutoJust support that it includes all that. So you have AutoJust profiles, including. Uh, dynamic uh, uh, embedded Ruby, rules, rules and classes, whatever, it will still work with Agama. Because that migration tool, that, or it's not a migration tool, it's a backward compatibility tool that Joseph was mentioning, uh, or contains all those features to have dynamic profiles. So you can just run Agama, will download your profile, will do the calculations, will adapt the profiles, will recalculate the new AutoJust profile, and when will, the result will be turned into a JSON into a JSON profile that then will be fed into a gamma. So yeah, it, all that is covered by, uh, in terms of backward compatibility. And of course, if you don't want, you can then migrate that to JSONnet. That should be better than all the, well, not, not, not should be better, but at least shared with other projects like Kubernetes. But you don't have to rewrite everything in JSONnet on day one if you don't want. Okay, and the other one that's probably the most flexible is shell script. Shell script just use the command line interface of Agama. So, so upload uh, uh, shell script for automatic installation, and it will do all steps. Like, yeah, it can load some some JSON file. It can do some editing. It can obtain some information. And what we even plan to do, that's probably the most flexible thing, is before the system is unmounted, you can uh, do some stuff on target system. Uh, the example I, I am uh, having uh, in uh, README is, for example, in SUSE we have a requirement to have Velociraptor uh, installed on each server, and yeah, it would be nice to have it immediately at the first boot, so it starts reporting immediately when you start. So basically, you can do installation, and then in, uh, in the automatic installation and in the shell script, before it reboots, you, you basically install additional levels here after do, them, do some deployment of configuration, enable systemd service, and then do, uh, do the reboot. And you have everything uh, at, this, uh, at the first boot. And yeah, yeah, our original plan that I have is uh, instead of writing the shell script, I plan to use combustion. But uh, for combustion, I have a bit trouble with its requirement to have uh, basically partition with label that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's called ignition and that's loaded from there. So, so if combustion starts supporting stuff like just deploy the, the shell script somewhere and uh, do, it, do it during first boot, then of course it will be possible also to easily use combustion. But currently for me, combustion and installer is kind of tricky because it needs additional partition. So, yeah, maybe hint for combustion developers that it would be nice to have uh, be able to, to just do the first boot configuration without need for additional partition. Yeah, and what it allows is uh, pre-configure, which basically means what, what you can do currently with shell script is that you will load uh, JSON, but don't start installation. So you will see the whole proposal, as uh, you can see in demo, but with modified, modified configuration. It's, uh, I know that some people use it in AutoJust. It's, it's called confirm mode. Basically, they, they load the profile, and, but they want before they click on install to just verify that everything is done as they, as they expected, just to check it. So it's also currently possible with, with Agama. Just load the JSON and don't start installation. Yeah, and maybe you notice in demo, we don't have the security section. So for us, it's still a question what to have here. We definitely want uh, security profiles, which is uh, what Ang uh, Ankar mentioned yesterday. It's yeah, some FIPS, some, some uh, yeah, certificates that, uh, sh uh, that basically, if, if you select it, you said that target machine sh should confirm to this uh, certificate. So it should be ready from the start to... to 
to apply to, to this uh, certificate. So that's one thing. Another thing is, yeah, yeah, you uh, see in previous presentation about SE Linux, and on OpenSUSE there is still option to select AppArmor, so it's questionable if, uh, yeah, if, if for installer there should be the selection of AppArmor and SE Linux in install itself, or if it should be done after the first boot. And uh, yeah, uh, one of the feature that I ask quite often because currently it's not visible in UI is uh, allow SSH access. Basically, it, it's in current installer in that you click that you want to be able to access to machine by SSH. So if there is firewall, it opens for a uh, port in firewall. It starts uh, yeah, SSH daemon. Yeah, and basically ensure that you can access to, to the machine via SSH from network. So that's question if it also belongs to this security section. Yeah, and time flies, so I will go to the next one. It's memory requirements. Uh, we are still not sure if it's issue, if people have enough memory or not. So my question is, who has at least two gigabytes of memory on their machines? Oh, it, yeah, it looks like majority, but not all of them. So <laughs> it's quite surprising. So who has at least one gigabyte of memory? Yeah, even less people. <laughs> yeah, so for us, the uh, question is how to solve it. Uh, uh, where we are basically limited is, uh, uh, especially for network boot, where you need to load all installer image into memory, is uh, firmware selection because you need to be able to boot anywhere, and firmware itself already eats a lot of space, so if you load the image into memory, then it already occupies a lot of memory. So, uh, yeah, having one gigabyte is uh, really, really challenging, especially when you start downloading uh, repository metadata from Tumbleweed. Tumbleweed has huge repositories, and yeah, it kills memory. So, currently, we, are at, we can run in two gigabytes, and yeah, I'm not sure if we can get below. The, our idea is different ISO for low memory machines, like uh, basically don't have their uh, browser, don't start the browser automatically, so you get the just uh, text interface. So my question is, uh, if you have so low memory machine, if you prefer to have a yeah, dedicated ISO that can work on, with lower memory requirements, who will use it? One, two, three, four, four people. Yeah, so let's see if it's worth effort. Yeah, if you have any, any other idea how to decrease memory consumption, we will welcome it, but as said, our currently the main issue is firmware limitation that cr increase the size of, of image. Yeah, and uh, then there is air gap scenario. As I mentioned, there are people that uh, don't have, yeah, uh, don't have fast internet, or even there are devices that's not intentionally connected to to network, so they they probably need uh, some something like full ISO, which is currently available for Tumbleweed. But even that full ISO have, has some some issues, like it's just a selected set of of packages, so it doesn't provide everything that Tumbleweed provides. We already face it when we uh, try to use it for Agama, that, for example, there is not uh, FDE2 tools, so, so you cannot have uh, use FDE if you have just Tumblr with full ISO. What currently Agama do is that uh, it first try to search for a partition with given label, and partition means also another ISO or uh, on a USB stick, uh, basically, with label that's label that's uh, already done with uh, Tumbleweed ISO or Lib ISO, and uh, search for repositories there. So it means if you have a virtual machine and uh, just connect one ISO with Agama and second ISO with Tumbleweed, then it, it will find the Tumbleweed repository and use it. So basically, it can already work with RGAP scenario. But question is if we we should use some kind of like repository ISO, or if it will be better to have something like all-in-one ISO that basically we can also do that one ISO contain whole repositories that can be installed. So full Tumbleweed, full micro OS, full that stuff. 
So uh, question, if it's better to have multiple ISOs that can be, for example, burned to multiple partitions on uh, USB, or having one ISO that, yeah, you just deploy, but it can be huge. I expect something like, yeah, maybe we don't even fit to 18 gigabytes, which is, yeah, double-sided DVD. That's this question. Yeah, and another question, if uh, this air gap scenario should be supported only for Leap, because for Tumbleweed, it doesn't make much sense for me. Even for, for a slow roll, it doesn't make much sense to have a rolling distribution and no network access. That's, that's like, yeah, contradicting for me. Yeah, Neil, Anchor, Neil. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know. The mirrors suck where I live, so I use the DVD to be able to install Tumbleweed without, you know, it stalling out in the middle. So, realistically, as long as the mirror situation is kind of bad for where I live, it, I kind of rely on the DVDs to be able to install properly. Yeah, Lubos? Uh, a little correction. We have actually offline repository image for Leap Microsync since 6.0. Because we don't have install image, we, we have the air gap image, if we can quite like that. Yeah. Ask yeah. Simon, by the way. He's from Australia. He has to deal with that. Ask him what he prefers. I guess many people will be in a similar situation. Is Simon Lee here? So, I use a weird set of packages. And so for my use case, the net, our traditional net installs have been best because you, then you only install the, or download the RPMs you actually need. Yeah, so yeah, that, that's probably something we need to discuss with, with Lubos, what, what kind of delivery he, he would like to provide to users. We, we're just thinking what, what we should support in Agama, so yeah. Currently, Agama is flexible enough to support all of those scenarios, so yeah, it's just about uh, to select or discuss how to exactly do it. Yeah, and my last slide is about next milestone, because as you heard, we are released Agama 9, so we already have plan plans for Agama 10, uh, improving storage, uh, adding support for Dust, uh, ZFCP, and uh, improving UI. As Ankar shows, not all UI is fully adapted to be yeah, flexible and good looking on phones, so improving this. Improving AutoAst support, because we still know that some parts of AutoAst is not uh, well supported, and it can be. Uh, it's in our power. It's, it's more about uh, some, some uh, additional uh, script support and stuff like this, so we plan to improve it. And the uh, last thing is, is fit into section of adaptable installer, which is like that, yeah, security profiles basically allows uh, to fit distribution needs. Yeah, may maybe the more will appear, but currently it's more like, yeah, yeah, adapt. Uh, for example, for that security profiles, you need to limit some, some options. You need to provide some additional options, some additional packages to install. So we need to find a way how to, how to make, uh, yeah, installer flexible enough. To, to really fit into those uh, various requirements. So that's the plan uh, for the next milestone. Yeah, and I would like to thank you for your attention. And you can, yeah, there are some, still some questions, good. I believe uh, yesterday Ankur teased that you would be talking about extensibility. Is there anything you can already share about that? So with Yast there were the modules, Cockpit has the bridges. Is there something similar you're planning? Actually, we are in a very early stage. Uh, we have some proof of concept, but nothing we have really decided uh, that, like an um, API to create data. And one of the reasons is because we are not sure what are the needs. So uh, uh, we are more than welcome if you have an, anything in mind that you would like, any way in which you, you, you foresee that you will need to customize the installer either the UI, either adding new capabilities, or, or because you believe, OK, uh, this part of Agama, I'm very interested in this part, but I don't need the rest. Um, uh, please reach out to, add, to us, because we want to know what are the needs before we design any solution that maybe we will not. So that's, for us, a very important topic. Uh, before proposing something, knowing, basically, if you want to extend the installer if you miss something but you know it's very specific for your use case and it's not 
doesn't need to be upstream or whatever, or if there are some part of a gamma that you find especially useful and, and you want to use it in your in your own infrastructure, uh, we are all ears. Yeah. yeah, so we are basically collecting requirements now, so yeah, idle time to, to say it. And Lubos has probably the last question because yeah, lunch is already there, so yeah, Somebody don't be too hungry. To have a question. I was actually surprised to see Autoyast because I know that Agama came with like you were talking basically to Dbus in the past. So we will use Autoyast in Agama? No, no, no. Ah. It's not used underground. Uh, to explain it, basically we support Autoyast profiles, but not uh, it doesn't use the Autoyast itself. Only the tool that do the conversion use the Autoyast beneath because yeah, yeah, it r reads the data using all that Autoyast features and then transform it into JSON. And JSON is then yeah, used as common Algama JSON file. So, so it's converter, but not uh, that Autoyast runs uh, yeah. the profile. Because Autoyast is quite complex. Even the URLs, when you pass the URL where to take the profile, we have our own custom URLs with features that are only in the Autojust profile, in the Autojust URLs. So you have HTTP, HTTPS, all that. But you can also have. We 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 went pretty creative during the years. So, and the Autojust URLs are not something that cool or any other tool could process. So we really need uh, about fetching files and about processing XML. Our XML is also quite special. So. Processing the XML and, and fetching data from the, from, from the network and all that is still use the very same core because we want to ensure backward compatibility because our customers rely on that. But then the real installation will be no auto just free. Yeah, and I see Neil, so yeah, really the f latest. That's what we wanted, people asking questions. So that's yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you're talking about AutoYAS compatibility here and transform, converting it internally to be able to run subsets of it for your thing. Uh, how difficult would it be to do the same thing with supporting kickstarts? Because uh, kickstarts are basically defined with, they have a schema, they have a basic definition format, and there's a Python module that turns it into something like a dictionary, which you could then export as JSON and do whatever you want with it. Um, how difficult would it be for you guys to also add a way to handle that? Like this kind of ties into the support other distros type thing. And, you know, I am morbidly curious about using Agama to install like Fedora type systems as well. So, yeah. Or yeah, yeah, kick. yeah. Or yeah, yeah. Or even what Lubos says about migrating RHEL or whatever. Yeah, basically, I, I already looking at Kickstart even for uh, translating to Autoyast, and yeah, some parts should be relatively easy to, to get from Kickstart, and some parts will be hard because it's yeah, it's it's like a different kind of definition. Definition, for example, for that storage in Kickstart, you create the exact partition on with given names, with given sizes, which is yeah, like it's it's not like a guided proposal, but it's like yeah, specific ones, and it's also also somehow order it. So so we need to yeah, it basically goes from the uh, for, like if you write it on command line, but Autoast is more like yeah, how it should look like, and then apply it. So yeah, there are some differences, and yeah, of course if you want to contribute it, you probably knows the Kickstarter better than me. So if you want to contribute it. You can read what, uh, what uh, currently JSON can do and create a tool that do the conversion. Yeah. At, at least some, some yeah, yeah, probably some, something similar to, auto, uh, to, to our AutoS tool. Probably you cannot support all features, but giving some, some, some initial conversion should not be hard, like, yeah, create some, some rough JSON and, yeah, mention, like, did, did I don't understand those parts or I cannot translate those parts, so please adapt. To, to your needs, to, to the final JSON, yeah, yeah, do it yourself or, yeah. So, good idea and we welcome any pull requests. So, thanks and I don't want to delay you more for your lunch. So, thanks. <laughs>